Number two. I'll show the nations thy nakedness and shame. That's verse 5, chapter 3, verse 5. Behold, I'm against you, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Do you know what that means? The nations that once feared you, revered you, awed over you, envied you, they're going to discover that you're as weak as a you, You'll become weak as women. That's verse 13. Look at verse 13. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open to thy enemies. The fire shall destroy thy bars. You know what that means? You'll become a soft, effeminate people. Listen, hear me. I study the histories of empires. I love history. And yet I tremble over it. And there's never been a society that's been destroyed that didn't get soft and effeminate. And they end up like the Empire of Belshazzar. You know what they do when they see the handwriting on the wall and they begin to tremble? They know something's about to happen. They call for the prophets. And they will listen for a while. They're willing to put a gold chain around his neck. They'll give him a pat on the back and go right back to the drinking and die the next day. And this is the day when we're patting the prophets and say, boy, that's true. America is suffering. America is under judgment. Oh, yeah, everybody sees it. And go back to the party. The gates of your land shall be set wide open to your enemies. Do you know what that means now? The drug lords from Cambodia, from Colombia, from Mexico, from Pakistan, they laugh at our border patrols. Our borders are sieved. They're leaking everywhere. Castro dumped hundreds of prisoners, hundreds of spies, emptied his jails. Now, thank God for the godly Christians that came. There are many Pentecostals, Baptists. I mean, there's a revival down in Miami of wonderful Cuban people that came. We've got wonderful Cuban refugees here. We've got wonderful aliens from around the country, many of them in this church. But along with that, the scripture says the enemy was going to come in through this wave. They're pouring in by the multitudes now. And for every godly person, every good person, there are ten sent by the devil to bring destruction upon America. Your gates of your land shall be set wide open and thine enemies, unto thine enemies. Number three, a baptism of filth. Verse 6, 3. Chapter 3, verse 6. This is God speaking. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile, and I'll set thee up as a gazing stock. And you know what Nahum is saying? He's saying that God is so furious. A God has been patient, a God has been long-suffering, but a God who sees the people so incensed against Him, so in rebellion, so steeped in their sin, so wanting their rebellion, so wanting, Phil. It's a picture of God picking up dirt and mud and throwing it on the people. He said, I'll cast mud, I'll cast dirt upon you. God said, you want it? You want it? I'll let you have it. Like then we've become the shame and disgrace of the world. The world blushes at our iniquity. You know what the Bible says? You will become a derision of tourists and foreigners. All that pass by her shall hiss at her. Zephaniah said, this is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, there's none beside me. She shall become a desolation, a place of beasts alive down. And everyone that passes by her, all her tourists, all that pass by her shall hiss at her and wag their hands. And they say, no, enough. I can't handle it. I took men from Poland. I preached crusades in Poland. And I, I preached under the, 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 behind the Iron Curtain. And I saw their, many of their lack of freedom. And I saw their hardships. We had three men from Poland, one of businessmen, and I took them to the streets of New York. These men wept, and they, they kept dabbing their eyes with a handkerchief, and we went down 41st Street, up 8th Avenue, and then down 42nd Street. And it was just about dusk, late, in early evening, and the lights were on. And this, these brothers from Poland, one of them was trembling, the businessman. He took me by the arm. He said, David, to an interpreter, this is hell. This is hell. There's nothing in Poland like this. I've been in Russia. There's nothing in Russia like this. He said, could we get out of here? I took 
an ungodly camera crew from Denmark where they have pornography and everything else. I took a camera crew down to 42nd Street and they asked me to get them off. These were ungodly men who said this is hell. There's no place like it on the face of the earth. And it's right outside the doors of this church. I will pour abominable filth upon you. I'll make you vile. I'll make you a horrible example to the whole world, he said. Do you know that our number, uh, you, you know that up to five years ago we were importing much of our pornography from Sweden and Denmark? You know now in five years it's a multi-billion dollar business. One of our biggest exports is pornography to the whole world. Do you remember when Israel became so corrupt, corrupted worse than Sodom? Isaiah, or rather the prophet Ezekiel said, even the daughters of the Philistines are shocked at your lewd ways. That's in Ezekiel 16, 47, 48. You can read it. Even the ungodly heathen Philistines blush at you. The Russians blush. The Chinese blush. The whole world blushes at our wickedness. We're drowning in pornography. Our television is filthy. Our VCR movies. Even the daytime soap operas now are bragging about their filth. God's doing America what he did to Israel. They started lusting for flesh in the desert. He said, you shall eat your flesh not one day, not two, nor five, but until it comes out your nostrils and it becomes loathsome to you. God said, you want it? It'll come out your nostrils. Now, number four, and this is where I tried to soften it, and God won't let me. I warned from this pulpit two years ago, just the day before the stock went, the market went down on October 19th. I stood in our pulpit in town hall, and I said, if you want to see history made, you meet me tomorrow down at the stock market. We went down there. Brother Phillips was down there with me. I was in the stock market. I was in there when it happened and watched it go down. And again, last week, I stood in this pulpit and said, don't go into debt because of what's coming. Don't go into debt. Number four, a massive depression out of which there'll be no escape. Now, we don't like to hear about economic collapse. Because the word depression scares us as Americans. You see, the only judgment we understand is the kind that hits our pocketbook. The corpses don't do it. We can walk over them. We can see the filth on. It's right in your home because that television set right there is the floodgate of the floods of hell. I'm going to stand before you as a faithful shepherd one day. I'm going to stand before everybody that's heard me. And these other pastors have preached the same thing. We're going to stand before you on the judgment day. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we warned you about that filth. We warned you it was an idol out of the pit of hell. We warned you that it was time to seek God and throw away that box. Get it out of your house. And some of you laughed at me. You have absolutely laughed at me. You haven't even heard a word I've said. And you almost feel like I'm angry. I'm not angry at you. I hear the trumpet sound. I know the judgment's at the door. What are you going to do when it suddenly collapses? When it suddenly, well, I'll do it now. I'll do it now. You say, oh, I've got it under control. I can handle it. Just like the drug addicts told us all along, I've handled a little bit of pot. I can handle a little bit of crack. I have to do this at the risk of some of you leaving and never coming back to this church. But I have to obey God. Listen, listen please. Hold on, because I'm, 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 I'm coming down to the last part of this. It's happened to every past society, and it's going to happen to us. Ezekiel, to Jerusalem, he said, God has diminished your ordinary food. They were under judgment. The first thing God did, he said, I'm going to diminish your ordinary food. Nahum 3.16, look at it. Nahum 3.16. Here it is. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. 
All right, listen to me, please. Here's, here's what that scripture means. Listen closely now. Nahum, the prophet, was warning Nineveh of an insidious enemy that was coming to destroy its economy. Nineveh had been exporting glassworks, textiles, carpets, carvings of ivory, artworks of all kinds, gems, silver, and spices, and gold. And the merchants had traveled the world, but along with that merchandising came in, and what they did, foreign governments from Egypt, from Babylon, and other governments had come in, and like an enemy, they swooped down, they spread themselves over the rich spoil, and they fled away with all the loot. They took over and fled. And they devastated the economy of Nineveh. And that's what the scripture says. Right here, the canker worm had spoiled it, and then they flowed away. They've gone. All of those who were trading with you, they're gone. Today's paper, Daily News. This is another cartoon, and I'm, here, I'm surprised how, how discerning their cartoonists are and how blind preachers are. Not all of them, thank God. I can't generalize that. I, I mean, the majority, perhaps. You know what it says? Mr. President, the Japanese have reversed their trade policy. They want to buy more American products. The President. Great. What made them change their minds? They now own all American companies. You can be sure the day is not far off when Japan and Taiwan and Korea and Germany take their money and flee. All they that look upon thee shall flee. Nahum 3, 7. All they that look upon thee shall flee and say, Nineveh has laid waste. Who shall bemoan her? Where shall she find any comforters? Yeah, they want the money now from their cars and their television sets. But, oh, brother, sister, when the shaking comes and the economy begins to shake and tremble, they're going to flee. All they that hear the news, look at verse 19, all they that hear the news of thee shall clap their hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? Japan will stop buying our government bonds, as will other nations. God will cause our enemies, Lamentations 2.17, God shall cause the enemies to rejoice over thee. The Bible predicts a crash of the real estate market, and I'll give it to you, here it is. It's in Zephaniah 2.14. Just turn over two chapters. There are two, two books. Zephaniah, just a few pages to the right. Look at verse 14. And the flock shall lay down. 2.14. The flock shall lay down in the midst of and all the beasts of the nations. And he's, he's prophesying against Nineveh. All the beasts of the nations, both the concomitant and the bitter, shall lodge in the upper littles of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Here it is. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the seed of work. Listen to me. Look this way, please. The threshold represents, represents your house, your, our real estate. And the Bible says the birds, and the New American Standard said the birds are going to sing in their windows. The windows are going to be empty. These are going to be devastated buildings. Do you know, I got laughed at till it hurt me. When we were prophesying three, four years ago that there was going to be a, a shaking in the economy in Texas and nobody wanted to listen then. Now you go to Houston and you see skyscrapers standing empty. You go to Dallas and you see the big fancy glass buildings standing empty in the heart of Dallas, Texas, which was once the richest city in America. One of the richest cities in America now, they stand like empty tombstones. The bitter shall lodge in the upper littles, the birds, in other words, shall sing in the windows. The day of the trumpet alarm against your fence cities and against your high towers, the Trump towers, the Zeckendorf towers. I tell you, the day is coming in New York City. There's going to be such an economic devastation that many of these skyscrapers are going to stand empty. The windows are going to be cracked and they're going to be overcrowded with poor and homeless people taking them over. It's already happening in three of our cities. Denver's got empty skyscrapers. Houston, it's already here, folks. Wake up. It's already here. No, you say, brother, when's all this going to happen? Nahum 1.14 says, The Lord has given a commandment concerning thee to cut you off, for you have become vile. Listen, please, I've, I've got a few things on my heart here before I close. 
These things are already in order. All that God has to do now is accelerate everything that He's put in place. Just the word that keeps coming to me from the Holy Spirit is acceleration. For the last year, acceleration. It builds and builds and builds. All right, what about the people of God? You said, well, you've got me scared to death. I tell you what, when I saw where we are from what I've read from other cities and what God's done when we reached this point, I put my head in the desk yesterday and I cried like a baby. I cried. I said, God, it's here. It's already here. We don't know it. It's here. And we've got people still playing games. We have people coming to Times Square Church who still haven't laid down their sins. We've got people who are not ready when it hits. And God's trying to let this church know it won't be caught unaware. Now, what about the people of God? I'm not going to tell you that people are not going to lose their homes. Hebrews 10.34, the apostle said, You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. There's going to be mass unemployment. There'll be a lot of Christians who don't have jobs. There's going to be suffering. That you, not one person in this building is going to keep the lifestyle they have now. Not one. And so you better start cutting back now. It is absolute evil in the sight of God to hear the trumpet sound and then go out and live and spend carelessly. Pay your vows. Keep your books up to date. From the smallest to the greatest among us, and I say that before God to myself, to all of us, begin to cut back your lifestyle. Don't spend. You know we don't need half the junk we're buying. But what about the people of God? How, what are we going to do when this, this thing happens? Believe me, brother, sister, there have been recessions and there's been a few depressions and America's always come out of it. We are not coming out of this, folks. We're heading near the year 2000. I mean, folks, it's all coming down. It's all shaping up. We're getting ready because we're citizens of another country, by the way. We're not citizens of the United States now. We're citizens of a higher country. All right. How, how do you know what God's going to do for us? How He's going to protect us? Well, just like we did, we, we go to the Bible and see what God's character is. We found out how He judges. How does He keep people? What is God's record? Uh, what happened when He sent a flood and destroyed the whole world? Didn't the righteous escape? Didn't He put them into an ark and float them above it all? Did He? Is that something? Is that some insight to the character of God? How about Daniel? And the three Hebrew children, a lion's den in the furnace. Did they survive the furnace? They went into it. Did they come out of it? Was there a hair of their head singed? Was there a smell of smoke on their bodies? Does that tell you about the character of God? His love for His people? God destroyed Sodom. But before, He sent an angel to look at this city and also to do what? Come on, Lot. He could have, I'd say, anyone who heard the message could have been saved and walked out. Come on, the city's going down, come on out. And God sends, he chases Lot up into the hills. And he sits, he sits there and watches it burn. In the destitution of Jerusalem, Jesus knew that enemy armies would come and be the greatest desolation Jerusalem ever saw. And what did Jesus say? When you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, flee to the mountains, depart out of it. And you in the country, don't go near it. You'll find that in Luke 21, 20. He was speaking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And he said, I'm going to give you a clue. I love my people. And he said to his church, when you get word that armies are marching toward Jerusalem, you hear the report, pack your bags, pack your bags and go up into the hills and you watch it. But don't go near the city. If you're out there in your field and you're plowing and you see the soldiers coming, marching toward the gates of Jerusalem, don't go back and get your clothes. Don't go back in the city. Forget your coat. Forget everything else. Run. Flee from the city. And those who fled were saved. Does that tell you something about the character of God? Oh, but I'll tell you what. It's right here in Nahum also. <laughs> God doesn't... I'll tell you. Uh, would you go back to Nahum? Are you ready to... Rejoice in the Lord a little bit. <laughs> Nahum, first chapter. Did, uh, <laughs> folks, God, he just told Nineveh, God's serious. 
God's going to bring it down. It's all over. Judgment's at the door. But look at the message to God's people. In fact, it, God, this was a message to anyone who would listen. Verse 7. The Lord is good. Well, I thought he was furious. He's, both, he's furious at the wicked. He's furious at the nations rejected him. But for his people, the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. I want you to go to Psalm 31, please. I'm going to close in just a moment. Psalm 31. Beloved, the message this morning, Brother Phillips preached, really strengthened my heart to preach this message tonight. To be contented, no matter what's coming. Not to look at the... uh, (laughs) Listen... Right now, all over the world, there are countries living in depression, filled with hundreds and thousands of Christians who are making it. They're surviving, there's revival, and God is feeding them. They're not starving to death. I'll tell you what, they're not eating steak. They're not eating pizza with pepperoni. But they are alive and well. God's keeping them. He's doing it in China. He's doing it in Nicaragua. He's doing it all over the world. He's doing it in Haiti right now. A poverty stricken age. God's keeping his people. Glory be to God. We may eat bushels of rice, but we're going to live. We're not going to starve. Hallelujah. I may have to move in with you, and you may have to move in with me, but we'll just have a revival meeting. We'll have a prayer meeting. Chapter 31, let's begin to read. Just follow me. I'll read it and just listen. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. All right. There's a safe house. God's moving us right now into a safe house through the word of God. You know what that that word means? A fortified house built of rock. We are going into a rock fortress where no depressant, no demon, no murderer, nobody can move the people of God. God says, I'm a stronghold for those who will trust in me. Oh, glory to God. Thou art my rock, verse 3, and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. He's going to lead us and guide us through it all, right to the end. Pull me out of the net that they've laid privately for me, for thou art my strength. Into thy, oh, here it is. Here's how, I, here's how I tend to survive. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord, I give it all to you. Some of you campers, you spend hundreds of dollars to go out and camp. You buy a tent, you get all this stuff, and you can't wait all year long to go live in a tent. <laughs> Tell me we can't survive. Oh, Lord of God. <laughs> they can have it all. Nobody can take what we have in our hearts. Hallelujah. Nobody can take this hope. Into thy hand. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me. Oh, Lord God of truth. I've hated them to regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversity. You've not set me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. That's a rock house. Glory be to God. Oh, hallelujah. Folks. Didn't Jesus say when you see all these things begin to happen and he named these fearful sights that would cause men to lose their very heart with heart attacks, fearful things coming on their feet. He said, look up and rejoice for your redemption draw with nigh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make the purpose of the message tonight is to wake us up, but more than that is to give us this hope that those who are going to walk in his repentance, those who are going to walk in his righteousness, trusting in him, They're going to see miracle after miracle. Brother, sister, you're going to live the book of Acts. We're going to live this book of Acts. Hallelujah. Day's going to come. You won't be able to run to a hospital or a doctor. You're going to have to trust Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. (laughs) 
America is dying, but Zion is rising. Zion. The holy city of God. The holy city of God. You say, what am I going to do? I, I'm going to occupy till he comes. I want to be living the way I should live so that if Jesus comes tonight, I don't have to change anything. You that are in business, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord. You that are laborers, labor is unto the Lord. Housewife, be a good housewife. Go about your work. Go about your work with this glorious hope in your heart. And when you see these fearful things, don't let it shake your heart. Listen, folks, get into your heart. God's going to keep you. Protect you. And see you through it. And even in the suffering, oh, there'll be a lot of suffering. But that's only going to bring the graces of the Lord Jesus in our hearts. Stand, please. Is God moving in your heart? You know, it's, it's tragic. It's very tragic that some of you here tonight are not in a state of readiness. You're not in a state of readiness. Materialism of the things of this world, you're still looking in the wrong direction. Your heart. Your heart's not burning to Him. Is there any need for you tonight to draw close to the Lord? Is there any need for you to come down here tonight and let me pray for you? I don't know what it is, but if you feel that drawing of the Holy Spirit, some of you walked in here not right with God. You, your heart's cold. This is your night up in the balcony. You come down the stairs either side, come down any aisle. You hear the main floor come and stand here and ask the Lord tonight to fill you with an expectancy, give you clean hands and a pure heart, and give you the courage to do what He's told you to do, to obey Him in all things. Do you want to obey the Lord in all matters? Are you willing to lay down all your idols and walk before Him in righteousness? You feel the tug at your heart? Come on, meet us down here right now. Let's believe God for a miracle in your life, in your home right now. You feel that tug or pull wherever you're at, up in the balcony. God's moving up there in the balcony, here on the main floor, wherever you're at. You feel the tug. Come and join these that are coming to the altar right now. God bless you. Jesus, wake this church, wake us all to the hour in which we live, and yet not to be afraid, but to strengthen us in hope. You're a God of hope. 
You are God of hope. But Lord, we will not be blind to the day in which we live. We will not be blind. Jesus, we thank you for stirring our hearts. You that have come forward, look this way, please. I'm going to ask the Lord by His Holy Spirit right now to put something fresh and alive in your heart from heaven, right from Jesus right now. Raise both hands to the Lord. Just raise your hands. Would you talk to Him right now? I don't know why you're here, but tell the Lord exactly why you're here. Just right out loud, tell Him, Lord, I'm here for, for forgiveness. I'm here for to be awakened. Tell Him why you're here right now. Tell Him exactly why you came down to this altar. Tell Him right now. Let's, let's speak it right out. Lord, touch me. Here's why I'm here. Tell Him. Be honest with Him right now. Before we pray, just tell Him in your own words why you're here. Lord Jesus, shake me, stir me. I want to lay everything down here tonight. I want to be changed by your power. Hallelujah. Oh, Holy Spirit, come now. Oh, sweep over everyone that's here. Sweep over us, Lord, and touch us. Sweep over us, Lord, and quicken us. Raise your hands and pray this prayer with me right now. If it comes from your heart, it'll touch God. If it's not from your heart, it won't go above your head. Pray it from your heart. Oh, Jesus, I do need you. I need your touch, your love, and your forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord, for being careless and at ease. I ask you to wake me up and keep me awake. So the enemy can't deceive me. Remove all my sins. Blot them out. Cleanse me with your blood. I trust you, Jesus, for hope, cleansing, and forgiveness. And I know you'll keep me because I'm going to commit it all to you. Right now, I commit my life and all that I am and all that I have to my blessed Jesus. Now thank Him right now. Lord, I thank You. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Fill every heart. Fill every life, Lord, with Your presence. Glory be to God. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Glory be to God. Glory be to Jesus. Glory be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of you that came forward tonight are up here for the first time at this altar in this church? You've never been up here before. Would you raise your hand, please? Raise it high. All right. You that have your hand raised, would you make your way right through the crowd and go this way to our, our prayer room? We want to talk to you personally. We'd like to share with you right this way. Make your way right through the crowd, please. All here for the first time. You've, you've come in here tonight for the first time. We'd like to minister to you one-on-one. -on -one. We'd like to really touch God with you. Amen. Make your way right through the crowd. Come this way, please. These that are going uh, downstairs, the Lord bless you. There's a goodly number. Wait, let's pray God touch every one of these lives. Lord, quicken them. And, and let their hearts be so in fire, so on fire tonight, so touched by the hand of Jesus. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. This is the conclusion of the case.